Hello, my name is Mukta Kulkarni. I'm a Urogynecology Fellow from Monash Health in Melbourne. Thank you for this opportunity to present about our study looking at long-term outcomes following sacrocolpopexy. This study received a hospital-based research grant and there are no other disclosures. Pelvic organ prolapse is defined as downward displacement of female pelvic organs into or through the vagina. The prevalence can vary depending on whether a subjective or objective definition is used. And the surgery for prolapse can also vary anywhere from 6 to 18 percent, and about 300,000 surgeries are performed annually in the United States alone. If a hysterectomy is performed for prolapse, the risk of recurrence for vault prolapse is estimated at around 12%. Anterior vaginal wall prolapse is the commonly detected prolapse and is strongly associated with apical prolapse. Now, sacrocolpopexy is considered gold standard for apical or multi-compartment prolapse. There is significant heterogeneity in the way this procedure is performed. Outcomes studied could be potentially influenced by these technical choices made intraoperatively, including the weight of the mesh used. The aim of our study is to assess long-term anatomic and subjective outcomes following sacrocolpopexy based on the weight of the mesh used. This is a cohort study at a public tertiary hospital and single surgeon series in two private hospitals in Melbourne. It included all women who underwent sacrocolpopexy for symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse. Patients were identified using electronic search of the institutional database of the tertiary hospital and the medical practice. Preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative data was obtained from medical records. Data collected included demographics, past medical and surgical history, preoperative stage of prolapse, body mass index, any simultaneous procedures performed, type of mesh used, and intra- and post-operative complications. Reoperation for recurrence of prolapse and mesh complications was also noted. All identified patients were invited to participate in a study for a follow-up appointment. Clinical evaluation at follow-up was not by an independent assessor not involved in the surgery. Our primary outcome was composite failure. It could include one of the following three. Stage two or more apical prolapse, anterior or posterior vaginal wall beyond the hymen, complaining of a bulge on questionnaire, or retreatment with surgery or pessary. Patients were divided into two groups. One group that received ultra lightweight, in our study, which was less than 20 grams, received Ristorel Y mesh, and the other group, which was lightweight mesh, any mesh that weighed more than 25 grams. That included Upsilon, UltraPro, Interpro, Gyne Mesh, and Ypro. For secondary outcomes, functional outcomes were assessed using a validated questionnaire like Australian Pelvic Floor Questionnaire, patient global impression of improvement, and complications and reoperation rate. We calculated incidence rate ratios for composite failure because there was difference in length of follow-up between the two groups. Crude and adjusted incidence rate ratios were also reported after controlling for age, BMI, parity, smoking, and presence of advanced prolapse preoperatively. We identified 358 patients who underwent sacrocolpopexy. 220 of these attended a later follow-up and composite outcomes for these are available. 95 had ultralight weight mesh and 125 had lightweight mesh. This table describes the baseline demographics, preoperative and intraoperative data. The groups are similar for the stage of prolapse, BMI, previous prolapse and incontinence surgery, parity and mode of delivery. Women undergoing sacrocolpopexy with ultra lightweight mesh were slightly older and had better bladder and prolapse domain scores on APFQ. Due to the temporal differences in the use of the ultra light and lightweight mesh, the group with lightweight mesh had significantly longer follow-up, median of 63 months compared to 36 months. For composite failure, 23% in the ultra lightweight group and 33% in the lightweight group met the composite failure criteria. Due to the difference in time to follow-up, incidence rate of failure was calculated. 
After adjusting for time to follow up, age, BMI, parity, smoking, and presence of advanced prolapse prior to surgery, the difference in rates between the groups remain non-statistically significant. There was significant improvement in all domains of APFQ preoperatively and postoperatively. There was no difference between the groups at follow-up. For PGII, 90% in the ultralight group reported very much better or much better compared to 74% in the lightweight group. This difference remained significant after accounting for the difference of follow-up time. There was a 7% exposure rate in the ultralight group and 8% in the lightweight group. One in the ultralight group and four in the light group had surgical excision. Others were managed conservatively. 5% in the ultralight and 13% in the lightweight group underwent reoperation. In particular, two in the ultralight group had apical reoperation and eight in the lightweight group had apical suspension. This was not statistically significant. In conclusion, there are no significant differences in the composite failure incidence rates between ultra lightweight and lightweight mesh used in sacrocolpopexy procedure when accounting for the length of follow up. Thank you once again for this opportunity.